So today we're going to talk about sequential estimation of dynamic discrete choice models and we're going to look at two particular classes of very related estimation methods. One is called the CCP estimator, it's like a two-step estimator, uh, originally developed by Hudson Miller. And then the other is the nested suit likelihood algorithm suggested by Akira Gabiria and Mira that is essentially uh, following the sequence of not doing two-step estimation but like a k-step estimation and gradually improving on the properties of the estimator. Okay, so um, yeah, we'll get to it. I'll show you all the details. Um, so why, why is this, you know, why are we doing this? Okay, so you know, this is kind of motivated by this this uh, last couple of lectures where we actually use quite a lot of effort in solving fixed point problems. And the question is really, do we really need to solve the dynamic program to estimate the model? And it turns out that's not necessarily the case. I mean, one if, I mean, if you think about the nested fixed point algorithm, right? Just to remind you, it's like you need to solve for the uh, you need to solve for the expected value or, or the smooth value functions. Uh, here I call them V sigma. Um, for every time you want to calculate the choice probabilities, I mean, they're kind of indexing the continuation values um, for, for the agent. And, you know, you need to solve the model to get those, right? And they, they feed into the choice probabilities and they are following the likelihood function. And then you got this nested fixed point algorithm where you need to solve that fixed point over and over again. Okay, and that's pretty computational intensive to do that, especially when you have like large scale dynamic programs, right? With many state variables and many decisions. So what if we could just estimate those continuation values from the data without even solving the nested fixed point problem? Okay, that would really, you know, reduce the computational complexity involved in finding the structural parameters. Now, so here's another path-breaking paper. I've already referred you to like Rust 1987. So here, here's another really defining paper for this for this literature. It's a paper by Hudson Miller from Restut uh, 1993. It's called Conditional Choice Probabilities and the Estimation of Dynamic Models. Okay, and that's just really what they do. They 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 you know estimate the conditional choice probabilities and use that to estimate the model. So let me just you know briefly explain why. So I'm going to actually go into details with this later, just this kind of overview. So Hudson Miller's idea was to use observable data, oh, <laughs> observable data on the state variables and on the decision variables to estimate the conditional choice probabilities, or the CCPs as they call them. Okay, and then they develop this inversion theorem that shows that you can, uh, uh, m m you know, map the choice probabilities to differences in the value of function. I mean, just think about the logit model, right? You have choice probabilities that are essentially function of value function differences. So what they show is you can go the other way around and that, that idea applies uh, more generally than, than to the logit model. In particular, it, it applies to the case where you have conditional independence. Okay, so, so that's really cool. Um, and, and then, by simply using um, the estimated uh, conditional choice problems, you can you can actually estimate the con the uh, continuation value. So the idea is really this two-step estimator, where you first estimate what we'll call like reduced form conditional choice probabilities or the CCPs. You know we call them p hat, but these these are estimates of the conditional choice probabilities. You can go out and estimate those, and you can estimate them. If you have enough data, you can estimate them non-parametrically. And so if you already, you know, if the model is well specified, then you should be able to consistently estimate that guy, right? And so with knowledge of what P is, then from the inversion theorem, you can get knowledge of the, what the value function differences are. And you can use that to kind of measure the continuation values that you would otherwise need to solve for uh, by dynamic programming. Okay, and, and, and so, so that now you got everything that enter into the likelihood function, you got, you know, your utility functions that's parameterized and then these continuation values that you have like, you know, estimated or measured using the uh, estimated conditional choice probabilities from the first step and then you just go and maximize that, okay? And, and so we just keep those p's fixed, those p's hat fixed at the structural, uh, the non-parametric estimates and it really just you know, if your second criterion is some pseudo uh, likelihood, um, or we, you know, like we were trying to em mimic the same estimation procedure as we, we did in the, in the nested fixed point problem where we estimated maximum likelihood, well, then 
this is really just boiling down to estimating a logit model if you have the ID extreme value shocks. I mean, a static logit model. Okay, so first step, CCP estimators, and then a static logit model after that. Oh, well, that's easy. It can be done in Stata. It's not like you need uh, a whole course in dynamic programming to do that. So we'll refer to this as the Hudson Miller approach or the CCP estimator. So this version theorem is actually powerful for really many things. So I really encourage you to read that paper, um, the Hudson Miller paper, and, and actually a whole series of papers that's coming after that, including lots of work by 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 Bob Miller and Peter Acidi Akin, no most no, no, notably. Okay. So what what can they use this for? So they this I mean this version theorem is you say you can go from uh, value function differences to choice probabilities. And back. Well, the back is the the inversion, so you get to you can exp express value function differences as a function of choice probabilities. With that, you can de develop estimators to st uh, structurally estimate the structural parameters without solving the model as I've kind of just kind of outlined. Okay, and then you can you know provide empirically tractable representation of the conditional value function. You just you know can go out and estimate the conditional choice probabilities, and you put them into the Hot Miller inversion. You got your uh, you know, conditional value function or choice specific value functions, okay, that you would otherwise need to solve for but dynamic programming problem. Well, there's a catch here because you want to do counterfactuals, well, those functions gonna change, and then you would need to solve the model, okay? But not to estimate the model. Okay. So and uh, you can analyze identification in in uh, dynamic discrete choice models very clearly because you see you can see all, what all those identified objects are and, and say you you're willing to sh you're willing to say I know so and so much about the conditional choice problems maybe I have a um, I have a life cycle model where I'm not absorbing uh, the entire life cycle so I don't have the conditional choice probabilities over all the different years. But only a subset of it. What are the required assumptions that I need to put on, say, the utility function and so on, in order to actually obtain ut uh, identification? This you can see very clearly from that. So I'm not going to, you know, talk too much about um, identification. Um, um, in in in, but it's for, for 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 studying that, you know, this inversion theorem is really, you know, uh, it 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 makes that analysis much much easier because you can. Ex you know, you can map, uh, you can get a clear map from observables to the things you want to learn about. Um, anyway, so, and then, uh, you, I mean, there's also ways to in, improve, uh, 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 extend these ways of estimating this. There's, there's a paper by Acidi Akono and Miller, for instance, that that introduced a method for incorporating unobserved heterogeneity using the uh, uh, EM algorithm or expectation maximization algorithm. Okay, so you want to do that, you know, you, you, I'll refer you to that econometric paper. And then also some of the more latest work, uh, which is especially relevant for non-stationary models, have exploit uh, finite dependence, okay? So many problems, um, like for instance the Hirosaka problems and renewal problems, is something called the finite dependence uh, that drastically reduces the complexity of uh, the problem. So really in finite horizon models then, you know, you got actually a, a, a sum over the rest of the remaining time periods uh, of um, a, 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 a bunch of terms that depends on the choice probabilities. But if you only observe them in a little, you know, f out of the future, then uh, finite dependence is going to limit the amount of years we you will have to look into the future and, and limit the demands on how many years you would have to observe the choice probabilities or different ages. You know? So that's that's really powerful. So I'm not going to talk about finite dependence, uh, but but uh, there's some recent work by by again uh, um, uh, Acidi Akino and Miller. I think it came out just recently in the, in quantitative economics. So you know, take a look at that. That's really powerful if you want to look at uh, estimation of non-stationary models, including life cycle models. Okay, so but we're going to keep it simple here, and we're going to work with you know stationary infinite horizon models where where identification is a little bit easier. So the, the standard identification issues that we talked about previously applies here. Okay, so now that's a catch, okay? So why not everybody just, you know, using CCPs? Well, the first thing is you learn a whole lot about actually solving the model and simulating and simulating the model. You learn a whole lot about the dynamics and the incentives implied by the model, okay? That's one thing, you know, just simulating it and seeing how what is going on, okay? 
um, how how behavior is affected by different uh, changing different parameters. So that's uh, that entire process of trying to uh, estimate the model using a full solution approach is actually quite illuminating. Okay, and you you learn a lot of economics by doing so. Okay. Anyway, so but the the main I, I would say the main concern is you need to uh, you need to really be able to get good estimates of p for this to be valid. Okay, so maybe. Um, I mean, the, the CCP type of estimators, although they're consistent, if you can consistently estimate those CCPs, they may be, they're, they're inefficient due to the, uh, uh, since you're not enclosing the entire model structure from the choice model when you're estimating those CCPs, okay? And in turn, the parameters, uh, the second stage parameters you estimate, is also going to be inefficient, okay? And biased in small samples. For example, if you go out and estimate CCPs and not really super precise, you put them into the Bellman equation, and then Bellman equation is not satisfied. Well, then you know it's it's not. Be I mean, this is this is uh, because you don't have a precise estimate. Okay. Okay. So so that's that can happen. Okay. And and let me just just give you an example. I mean, this is uh, this is taken from the rust engine replacement paper where you got here. It's just a non-parametric hazard, or you know, our non-parametric estimate of the CCPs. And so, depending on how you discretize this, this graph is going to be more or less weekly, right? So here, doing non-parametric estimation um, on on that graph, uh, on on that on the conditional to obtain the conditional choice problems, well. There's not a lot of data out here, right? I mean, there's not a lot of buses that are 400, uh, you have driven 400,000 miles. And the number of replacements are actually really low. So once you start to bin what those probabilities are, there's not a lot of, you know, observations in the sales. Okay. I mean, even though it's out here where the choice probabilities are, are more frequent. So of course here you can use, uh, you know, um, you, what you should do is use, use smoothing methods and, and, and estimate, uh, and methods from, um, um, from you know, you know non-parametrics uh, like uh, you know you can use a sieve or estimator or you know include a bunch of polynomials into a logit or something. Okay, so but kind of smooth try to smooth out this graph. Or you can what people often do is that they run some like what I call it, like a flexible logit or just a frequency estimator. Um, okay. But but you can see okay so so there's not a lot of observation in each cell and and you know how do you you know judge whether how do you estimate from the data whether it, uh, uh, this particular uh, reduced form okay and and it, this only gets worse right if you have lots of explanatory variables or many state variables and you want to get the full non-parametric estimate of that. Okay, then you you know slice the you know one state variable into a hundred bins, another state variable into a hundred bins, and then there's nobody left in the cells. Okay, it's just going to be a bunch of zeros with you know some ones scattered everywhere. So so that's a challenge. Okay, so so that's why we're doing a Giddy Gabiri and Mira once in a while. It's actually um, kind of taking the best from two worlds, you could say. Here. Okay, so Giddy Gabiri and Mira, they have this paper. It's called the swapping the nested fixed point algorithm, a class of estimators for discrete mock decision models. Okay, the, the class of models we are studying. Okay, so actually that was the first econometric paper I uh, I ever read. Um, I I was I, I, I as a student I subscribed to the econometric society. I got a, you know a hard copy of the econometric I sent to my home every month, and this was the first issue in the two thousand. One, uh, I think November issue where this paper came out, and I just saw this title. I said, "What? What is going on? I, I, I just need to understand this. This is really, uh, this is sounds really cool. So who's cool calls a paper like that? Swapping the nested fixed point algorithm. Anyway, so, uh, so this is actually the first paper I ever read in econometric, uh, and it turned out to actually be pretty important uh, for my for what I ended up doing. Anyway, so that nested uh, pseudo likelihood NPL algorithm that's developed in that paper. Um, is building on Hudson Miller's work. Okay, so they what they do is they use the Hudson Miller inversion that that uh, allows you to express the solution to the dynamic programming problem in choice probability space rather than in value function space. Okay, so now you know you know the Bellman equation, right? And usually it goes from uh, it goes from a mapping from expected value functions to expected value functions or value functions to value functions or integrated value functions to integrated value functions, just like you've seen in the first couple of lectures. Okay, like, like, like we talked about in lecture 12, 13. 
and, and 14. Okay. So, um, but now you can re-express that Bellman equation so it goes from choice probabilities to choice probabilities. And then that also has a fixed point um, that you can solve for. So what Agitigabiri and Mira do is that they actually do that iteration when you're, you're iterating on that Bellman equation, you put that outside the nested fixed point algorithm, like, like the outer loop and then the inner loop, you do the maximization where you search over the parameter space. So what they really do is that they use a Hartz-Miller to, to go from the choice probability space to express the solution to the dynamic programming problem in choice probability space rather than in value function space. Okay, and then they recursively update when they're doing these as, as CCP type of estimates, they, they recursively update the conditional choice probabilities to obtain a sequence of estimators, one for each successive approximation they are doing on these, this NPL mapping. Okay, and, and they call that, um, they call those estimators policy iteration estimators because actually uh, finding a, the fixed point in pro choice probability space amounts to actually doing a policy iteration or a almost like a newton Kantorovich iteration. Okay, so it turns out that this has actually some very desirable properties like and computational properties. So when the nested pseudo likelihood estimator or algorithm is initialized with consistent non-parametric estimates of the CCPs, okay, so so like Hudson Miller would do, they would estimate those guys here non-parametrically. Um, then um, the sequence of those estimators, oh, sorry about that, the sequence of those uh, policy duration estimators, they hold the hot Miller as a special case, namely where you're not doing the updating, okay? And also has the Rust methods um, as, as a special case, and the limit where you just iterate and iterate, iterate and iterate and iterate, and, you know, then the fixed point on that policy iteration or NPL ma mapping um, is in the limit equal to maximum likelihood, that estimator. Okay. So that's kind of giving you, uh, in, uh, maybe, you know, I'm gonna go through all these details here, okay? But but the, the, the point here, with the, the key point with the paper is they are able to do, to balance the cost, the, the computational cost and the you know, the, the associated with the NFXP and the efficiency cost in terms of loss of statistical precision that arise from the two-step estimators, you, you're able to balance those uh, two costs because you can just, you know, iterate as long as you have patience, if you will, okay? You get more and more efficiency as you update those estimates more and more, but then, of course, that takes time. Okay, so that's that's really balancing that trade-off. Okay, they do some on the column. I'm going to show you some of the results based on again the bus engine replacement problem, um, and 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 that's kind of highlighting the features that that are, that, are, that are expressed here. Okay, so like it has Hotz Miller as a special case, it has NFXP as a special case, and then uh, anything in between can be used to kind of balance the the uh, computational cost versus the uh, efficiency cost or the curse of dimensionality related to solving the model relative to the curse dimensionality uh, with respect to estimating the conditional choice probabilities non-parametrically, because that's also a curse dimensionality uh, uh, relative to or uh, associated with non-parametric estimation. Okay, so let's just go to the equations and, you know, this was a lot of talking, so, but, but, but here's the problem. I'm going to use a slightly different notation to what we've looked at um, uh, previously, um, but 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 this is Agrigabiri and Mira's notation, which is very clear. So you know, just uh, to stay close to the paper, and I'm going to illustrate also the Hudson Miller estimator by using uh, by using Hotz, uh, Agrigabiri and Mira's uh, uh, novation, notations and derivations. So you know, given that the Hudson Miller idea is kind of a special case, there's no like reason to go you know go both through bait go through both papers and now you've you know seen them okay so here's a Bellman equation so we got like you know the usual state value functions the function of state variables and and this uh, it's parameterized by some parameters theta so like there's a utility function uh, which is known up to some parameters uh, theta u and then there is um, um, 
then there is uh, then there is a, 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 a transition density here for the state variables that's uh, that's determined by parameters theta g that kind of indexes the um, the the parameters of the unobserved state variables as we'll see and then theta f as for the observed state variables. And then, really, the decision maker maximizes the expected sum of discounted future utilities that we've seen many times by choosing actions A, so A for actions D instead of D for discrete choice, um, and then uh, taking into account how the state variables are evolving over time and how they are controlled by the decision A. Okay, so you know you change your choice here, like you replace the engine, that's going to affect your future state. Okay. And then the agents believes about um, the future state. Well, they're rational in, in, in the sense that um, we have, when we go and, and estimate the model, we, we assume that they are um, that they are uh, the same as the actual realized process for the state variables, uh, which obey this Markovian transition probability uh, of p, which we later will decomposed by the assumption of the you know, conditional independence that we've seen. The model solution is value function, which is a fixed point of this equation. So, you know, this is the general approach. And then we have, uh, you know, rest assumptions. We have the conditional independence assumption that allows you to, you know, factor the con the um, the control uh, transition probability matrix P here into these two objects. And, you know, essentially uh, ruling out any dependence of previous epsilons so, so epsilon uh, t plus one does not depend on the epsilon t, except from any dependence through uh, x. Okay, so once you control for x, then lack values of the epsilon does not matter. So you can say this is why it's called, uh, you know, uh, conditional independence, and it rules out like serial correlation in the epsilons. You got your additive uh, separability, as we have talked about uh, previously, that allows you to. You know, separate out the de de deterministic parts of the uh, of the choice specific values um, in a stochastic component and 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 a um, you know fixed components, and then you, we can assume here that the uh, uh, that's a finite domain of the observable state variables. In other words, the state variables is going to be discrete, or they, if they're not discrete, we're going to make them discrete. Okay, so we're going to discretize. Okay. And then uh, finally, once you know, every now and then, we're going to make the assumption of extreme value distributed epsilons. Okay. Uh, did I say? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the state variables they factor into these two uh, observed and unobserved state variables, and these that's a uh, these are a choice specific uh, continuously distributed variables that can be. You know, multivariate at extreme value, and if are we get logic formulas and everything is you know nice. So let's go on and define the smooth uh, uh, value function, sometimes also called the integrated value function or the Emacs operator. Um, uh, what it is is really like the, it's an integral of, of the value function, which is now a, a function. Of, it's a function of both state variables, right? We got two state variables here, so we get, here we got the. The value function, where right? so you got both x and epsilon in there, right? So this is potentially like pretty big um, uh, dimensional problem as we have talked about. Okay, but now you can because of the conditional independence assumption, you can integrate that guy out so it doesn't depend on epsilon. Okay, and so under the uh, conditional independence and as uh, and and um, uh, additive separability. Um, we can summarize the smooth Bellman equation in this way. And here I actually also use the fact that we have a finite number of, 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 of states. Um, uh, so I replace the, the, uh, the integral and the expectation operator with a sum. Um, and, and then we have this smooth Bellman operator. Okay, so I mean, um, this is just, uh, uh, you know, re simplifying a little bit. And we actually have been there in, in some of the previous uh, uh, lectures and this is a little bit of a review. If you ha if you then want to derive the distribution of the uh, dis discrete decision rule, uh, you can you can do that by uh, um, integrating over these different epsilons, and then you get the conditional choice probabilities 
that we will also refer to as CCPs, or conditional choice probabilities, because these are choice probabilities for action A conditional on state D. So these are like conditional choice probabilities. What do they depend on? Well, they depend on here the value choice specific values, also sometimes called conditional value functions um, for um, um, for each of the uh, each of the alternatives. Okay. So this is like this integral over, over the indicator function that that alternative A is the chosen alternative in the sense that it maximizes uh, the the, uh, uh, the the choice specific value functions. Okay. So you know this is all just uh, to remind you of of a little bit of notation. Okay. Now so what we want, and this is the you know the Hartz-Miller quest, right? We want to go from conditional choice probabilities to value functions. And, and and you can already see here, right? It's it's here. You can go. You can go if you knew what the choice specific value functions were. You can go from choice specific value functions to the choice probabilities. And then there's this a standard thing, a discrete choice model. You can you would need to make a, a, a um, it's only differences and utility that matters. So you can difference against one of those alternatives. And then it would not uh, change the maximization problem inside here. So really, you can express everything in choice uh, in, in value function differences instead. So you got a mapping from from value function differences to choice problems. And then what Hartz and Miller show is you can go the other way around. Okay. So um, basically, the choice problems are uniquely determined by the vector of normalized function differences. Let's just call them, you know, v tilde, which is like difference against some alternative. Let's just difference against alternative one. Okay. And then there is then then there exists a mapping, this Q mapping, such that. Uh, all the choice probabilities for tr pro for alternatives greater than uh, one um, is equal to that mapping, where you can you can get from uh, that choice probability difference to ch uh, value function difference to choice probabilities, and then uh, say we we are only looking at, at one of those alternatives because you know the choice probabilities are summing to one, so the last one is just you know residual determined as this one minus the sum of the other choice uh, conditional choice probabilities. Okay, so so here we would you know without uh, uh, any loss of generality, we can exclude the probability of alternative one. Okay, because it's kind of like determined by the by the sum of the rest of them, um, one minus the sum of the rest of them. Okay, so you know, Hans Miller established that this mapping is invertible under the conditional independence assumption, and 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 so that's uh, that's that can be uh, that idea can be used in a, like a pretty wide generality in 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 not only in unloaded models, but we'll see uh, we'll see it on the next slide that it's very easy to invert an unloaded model. Okay, so in general, also you take the derivatives. Um, you take the derivatives with respect to value function differences. Well, then you actually get uh, 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 this Q mapping. Okay, so when you take the derivative, oh, sorry, when you take the derivative of the social surplus function, which is you know the um, the, the the expected max or the E max operator or the smooth max operator, which you take the, the derivative with respect to that, then you get the Q mapping or you get the choice probabilities, loosely speaking. Okay, so the differences. Of the um, of this guy here, or with respect to value function differences, um, is going to be uh, equal to the choice probabilities, or the mapping that give go from differences in choice probabilities to uh, differences in value functions to to, to the choice probabilities. Okay, so here's here's an example. So under the logit or extreme value assumption, then the so, the social surplus function that we also call the log sum and the smooth max operator and many other things. Uh, McFadden called it at the social surplus function. And that's known as this log sum formula. Okay, so we can get this expression here in closed forms. You've got the sigma by, times the log of the sum of the exponentials, where you sum over all the uh, over the alter uh, choice alternatives. Okay, uh, those value functions. Yeah, and then the the uh, jth component of um, Q X um, that is. Uh, uh, I mean, when you take that that derivative with respect to value functions uh, or differences associated with with the jth alternative, then you get the choice probabilities as you know them, the uh, the logit formula. Okay, so it's not hard 
to get the value function differences in this case. I mean, in fact, you know, if you knew those p's, right, you can, how could you get, you can, you can get those value function differences pretty easily. I mean, maybe you have a nice exercise to that. Okay, so so that's uh, that's part of the quest. Now we, we want to go all the way from conditional choice probabilities to value function. Okay, so we can rewrite the smooth Bellman equation that we have over here. Okay, now we can rewrite that on this form. Essentially, what we're doing here is, you know, making use of the uh, law of iterating expectations and we're deriving the value functions here, well, the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, conditional on, on, on both x and the decision, the optimal decision. Okay, and then we'll multiply by the, the probability uh, for that decision. Okay. And then sum over all the decisions. So this is like really just an application of the law of iterated expectations. Okay, so what do we have here? Okay, so this this equation here where I cal calculate the conditional expectation of what we have in here, conditional on x, right? And conditional on the action. Okay, and then I just you know multiply with that. Okay, probability. So, uh, so it can be shown you, you can write in this way, okay? So with that, what do we have in here? We have the conditional choice probabilities. We have utility function. Those we can calculate. This we can estimate, right? And then we have something in here, which is like a selection term. This is the epsilons. And if they are at extreme value, you can actually calculate those in closed form, okay? The bottom line is they actually depend on the choice probabilities as well, okay? As we'll see. And then you have uh, the the smooth value functions, and this is also supposed to be known the transition probability matrix for the state variables. I mean, for example, we can go out and estimate it in the first step. Okay. And this is epsilon here. Let's look at that first. That's the conditional expectation of the unobservable epsilon conditional on the optimal choice. Alter uh, is alternative A. Okay. So so this is like. Um, uh, can be expressed in, 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 in this particular way here. See, the, the, this is really what it is, is that in general, this is a function of the choice probabilities, okay? And, the, um, and, and, and then he, in here, you have an integral um, over those, uh, that involves those choice probabilities. And, and so it clearly depends on the, these value function differences. But due to the uh, Hotz-Miller inversion, we can actually replace those by choice probabilities instead. Okay, okay. So, so now you see this term here depends on the choice probabilities, which, which we potentially observe. We can go out and estimate, and then now value function differences. But those value function differences we can uh, re-express in terms of value uh, of choice probabilities by using the inversion theorem and simply just get something that depends only on choice probabilities, okay? And then for the particular simple case of the load well, then that uh, conditional expectation is actually very, very uh, simple to compute. It only depends on Euler's constant minus log of the choice probabilities, which is a little bit like, uh, 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 in here, notice that it's only the choice probability of one alternative. Generally, if you don't have the the the, the independence across alternatives and the correlations of the epsilons, then it will depend on more alternatives. Okay, the whole vector as 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 it it does here in this general case. But but this is very easily computed. So now you have something here you can compute. You have something here that only depends on choice probabilities. You have something over here that you compute, and then we just we can solve for this guy here, basically depending on things we can compute and estimate. Very cool. Okay, so now we can write this in, in compact matrix notation. So here we're just stacking all the utilities. We're stacking all those conditional expectations of those epsilons, and then we're stacking also. Um, um, uh, uh, we are, are, are rewriting uh, this here, this this sum here in, in matrix notation here, uh, using uh, um, conditional transition probability matrices, um, just like we did in the first couple of lectures, where we 
Uh, remember those conditional choice pro uh, transition matrices for engine replacements. That when if you have the con if you condition on replacement, then you would have like a column in the beginning where there would be probables, and otherwise you would have zeros. And and if there are no replacement, then you would have those uh, non-zero elements of the off diagonal. So we've seen this many times, right? So these are the transitions transition matrix conditional on on the choice, right? So, so the, the cool thing is, we, we, we want to solve for this guy here, and you see everything else is known, right? This, this is known, this we can compute, this is depending on choice problems, this is also known as, it's just y is constant minus the log of p, and then this is, this is also something we can, uh, you know, potentially observe, we can estimate in the first step, and, and then what do we have here? Well, this is what we're solving for, and we can solve that system of equation. And if you have a finite number of state variables, this is just a, 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 a lin simple linear set of equations, which uh, you can solve this way. Okay, so you subtract this here on the other side, and then you get something like uh, 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 v sigma times ind indicator functions minus beta times those uh, tr transition problems. You remember, you need to compute that sum here, right? So, so that's what's going on here. Um, you know, you're summing over all those choice uh, problems, summing over all over the over all alternatives. So you get the unconditional transition matrix, which is like the choice probability weighted uh, sum of conditional choice probability matrices. So once you got that, you can just you know put that on the other side, and then you know you pre-multiply with that. Uh, matrix on, on both sides, and then you have isolated v uh, v sigma, and it's it's essentially just a function of things you know. Okay, so now we have what do we have here? Just to you know sum up, we have now a mapping from choice probabilities to smooth value functions, which is what we wanted to have. Now that's not all the way. Okay, we want to express the entire fixed point problem in probability space. Now recall that you know this is just repeating the equation we just, um, you know, got to, right? Okay, and the mapping from choice probabilities to smooth value functions. Okay, and the other, other primitives in the models, that like, like this stuff we can compute. Okay. But then we also have the logit formula, or we have the, the not the logit formula, but the conditional choice probabilities that depends on the value function differences. And what do we have here? Well, we have the smooth value function. So suppose we could just like, you know, substitute that right in here. Well, what do we have on the right-hand side? We have things here, the, the, the conditional value functions, that depends on essentially things we can compute and choice probabilities. Things we can compute. Okay, so now you have things you can compute and then things like, like the smooth value function we just said was a function of the choice probabilities, like, like, like a signify here, it's a mapping from choice probabilities to smooth value function. So now we have a mapping from smooth value function to smooth value, or from choice problems to choice problems, just like down here. So really, when we call this up here, the policy valuation operator in the sense that, you know, if you come with a policy, you get the value, okay? Um, so this is what's going on here. You come with a policy, and then you get the, get the, this, the value. Okay, now you can put that right into this formula for the choice probabilism too, and then we get the cornerstone of the uh, nested pseudo likelihood estimating, which is a mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities. Okay, so if you want to solve the model and find a fixed point on the uh, on the say, um, on, on on development equation and the resulting choice problems, you can just solve this fixed point problem instead. So it's just another Bellman equation or the Bellman equation in choice probability space rather than in value function space. Okay, so the original fixed point in value function space, I mean, where do we have it? Now this one here, the original one, this guy here, where we have a mapping from value functions to value functions now expressed in probability space. Um, here, we got a mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities. Uh, described by those two equations here. Okay, this depends on choice probabilities. We put it right into this the form for the choice probabilities here instead of this guy here that enters in the choice probabilities, and then you essentially have a mapping from choice probabilities to choice probabilities. If you want to solve a model, you can equally you can just as well solve for the fixed point p on this map. Okay. Okay. So. Um, 
call that the, the policy iteration operator. Okay. And, and indeed, if you want to find the fixed point, okay, it actually converges pretty quickly. And what you'll see, um, if you look at this here, what is this? It looks very much like something we have seen before, right? It's like the, uh, if you formulate the value function in smooth value function space, like in this space here, this is the Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator in that space, okay? Well, it's one minus the Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator in that space, invert, so inverted. So what does it look like? The newton Cantorovich iteration, the Newton iteration, or the policy iteration, and this is also really what it is. Okay, so if you do the fast convert, if you do the iteration on that mapping, well, it's, it's going to converge, and it's going to converge fast. And remember, here we have beta equal to 0 0.999, okay? So uh, you get some, you get the properties of this smooth, um, of the, um, the, the, the quadratic convergence that you get from, from Newton using this. So uh, that's, a, that's a very cool thing, okay? So, um, and here down here, this is a solution. So you start here and then you make the first iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration, and then you, uh, you, you, you converge really quickly here. You see uh, changes are getting smaller and smaller, and this, this really works. Now this is not, I mean, this is not so what we're gonna do for, for, the, for the estimation, because we can estimate parameters within uh, each of those iteration steps. Um, but this is, you can use this mapping here to, to solve the model. That's what I'm trying to show here. Let's talk about how you estimate the model. Okay, uh, well, let's go back, you know, you, you assume we have data now and actions and, and state variables. Now A and, and X instead of D and X. Okay, we have the, uh, with the two parts of the lock of the likelihood function that, you know, the factors in this way because of the conditional independence assumption. We're not gonna so much spend so much time on how you estimate the transition um, uh, the transition matrix, you can do that in the first step, or you can add that, and you can add that likelihood here. There's not really, like, it's not a big deal. Everything here is expressed in closed form, okay? So, so this is where we normally would have to evaluate the fixed point in order to get those choice probabilities. So instead, we, we're gonna do uh, the two-step, or the sequential estimation. So you, we, we're gonna consider here the two-step estimator and, and just, you know, estimate these uh, transition probability matrix in the first step, not to be confused with the, the, the two-step CCP types of estimator. Okay. And that's since it's kind of like a, uh, in the first step, you estimate both the transition probabilities and the CCPs, and then in the second step, you estimate the rest. Okay. Uh, so anyway, the bottom line is we're going we're gonna to focus on uh, estimation of the structural parameters that index the utility functions, and then the... Uh, uh, transition of the unobserved state variables. In this case, we work with a logit, so there's no parameters there. Um, and then we'll call that th those alpha, okay? So basically, um, uh, we, we're just gonna do the, the two-step approach. Okay, so here's, here's the uh, nested pseudo likelihood estimate uh, um, algorithm. So first you get uh, parameters that index the transition matrix. Okay, so you can, you can calculate, uh, let's go look, look in, so you can calculate essentially um, the, the, the transition matrix, okay, that enters for instance here, okay, or, or here, or here, okay. All this you can calculate once you have those parameters. Okay, so first you do that, and then you start with the initial guess for the conditional choice probable. It's called that P naught, and it lives in uh, uh, um, in, uh, on the unit uh, simplex, um, um, J dimensional, J alternatives, and there's like M grid points. So so you have one for, for uh, they're between zero and one. Um, and then at iteration K, you apply the following steps. Okay, so first you obtain a new pseudo likelihood estimate of the structural parameters the following way. Okay, so what do we have here? This is really the log of the probability of altern uh, choosing alternative A, I, the one observed for individual I, conditional on the observation for individual I's observation, okay, or value of X. So this is the likelihood, the log of the likelihood associated with a choice model, okay? 
it's just this is the way we calculate the choice probabilities. We're using the NPL mapping, okay? And how are we we using this? I mean, so the, this is choice probabilities, and then those are evaluated at the data, which are those which we write in this way, okay? So evaluate at those data, the observed conditional choices, and then the observed state. And then they're indexed by our previous guess of the conditional choice probabilities. So if you were to do the CCP two-step estimator, you would have estimated this in the first step, okay? Just from the data. And then the resulting estimator would be this CCP estimator, okay? The parameters like, you know, the, the parameters in the utility function for, for the replacement problem, like RC and C, that would be what we estimate here. Now, what you do then is that you update those, the implied, the, the, the choice probabilities using the policy um, or the uh, policy iteration operator, this guy here. So now, this is indexed by the parameters, right? I mean, it, the, the, this mapping here depends on, on parameters that, in, that enter into the utility functions, for instance, right? Okay, so every time you, you come with a new set of parameters, utility functions, you're gonna get a new mapping, right? And so we, we, we kind of signified that by subscripting that depends on the parameters, right? So, but you've just estimated those parameters, so now you got a new mapping, and this means that you're, you also have a new prediction for what the choice probabilities would be, because now the mapping is indexed by a new set of parameters. So what you do is you take your previous step, your estimated CCPs, and then you update it according to the new set of parameters. That gives you a new PK that is implied by the structural um, par parameters uh, um, after just one iteration on that mapping. Okay, and guess what? I mean, this depends on PK minus one. Why don't we just put it right back in and see if it converges, and it does. Okay, and that is you iterate on those two step until convergence, and then the it, 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 when when p and and alpha does not change anymore, then this is this p you find is a fixed point on that iteration on that on that uh, mapping the policy iteration mapping, meaning that it's allusion to the parameters uh, allusion to the model with at parameters alpha, and then this is actually converging to the maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, I don't know why I, 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 I repeat this uh, slice twice. Actually, this looks nicer. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, anyway, so for any K, for any set of parameters, um, our this sequence of estimators is coming out of, of following the sequence here. Um, the, you know, alpha 1 for after one iteration, alpha 2 after two iterations, which would shouldn't be alpha 1, but alpha 2 here, and then alpha k after k iterations. So if you iterate on that many times, it's going to converge to the MLE estimator by NFXP. But for any k before that, um, it is asymptotically equivalent to maximum likelihood. Why? Because as n go to infinity, CCPs are going to be... Um, um, and you know, recover it exactly, and then uh, the, 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 then uh, this estimator here converges to, to, to maximum likelihood as n go to infinity. Okay, so you can say that the, you get less and less need for uh, iterating on that uh, mapping or that MPL mapping or algorithm as you get more and more data, and and, and specifically that's the case also for. Um, for this version uh, of of the CCP estimator, as n go to infinity, it's going to be equivalent to 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 maximum likelihood. Okay, it's root and consistent, which is a nice property, um, and it's asymptotic normal, and you can calculate the variance covariance matrix. Although you have to account for the first step estimation error. Okay, and uh, Gita Gabiri and Mirror they have an expression that does that. Okay, and that that expression needs to be updated depending on um, um, you know that that depends on on how many iterations you do. Uh, in the limit, you can just use those that are uh, implied by uh, maximum likelihood if it's equivalent to maximum likelihood. 
Then uh, for K, well then this, this policy iteration operator encompasses the, the Hotz-Miller estimator and then for K going to infinity, it converges to the maximum likelihood estimator obtained by the nested fixed point algorithm. And there, you can just do standard inference and use like the, uh, you know, the, the inversion, the Hessians, and then, you know, take the take diagonal matrices, you got the standard errors of your square, take the square root and so on. Okay, so yeah, that's very cool. Okay, so I, I just want to illustrate, I could have shown like a sequence of, of parameter estimates, but another way to display it is the implied um, uh, probabilities. Okay, so remember when, you, when you're when you iterating on this mapping here, there's two things that's changing. You got this is changing, the, the sequence of policy iteration um, estimators, or, Okay, and then also the the choice problem, the implied choice problem is that is uh, re-indexed by this new estimate. Okay, so we're gonna look at this curve here. Okay, for for the circle problem, and here you got the replacement probability for after uh, one iteration. Okay, so so that is you initialize the CCPs with the um, 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 with 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 conditional choice probabilities and estimated from the data uh, and then <clears throat> we calculate what is the the last evaluation of that policy iteration that that's what we start to put in I think actually what I put in here was some flexible logit okay flexible logit where you put in like mileage grid uh, as one of the explanatory variables maybe that was like a, a linear term no cube okay a constant Okay, but if you put that right in, it's not equal to, it's not really the fixed point on that uh, mapping, uh, on this uh, policy iteration mapping, as it should be, okay? So we can take another iteration. Okay. And you see here, you get the same fixed point regardless of whether you uh, take the value functions, uh, the Bellman equation in value function space as um, implied by gamma, uh, the Bellman operator in value function space, or in probability space uh, uh, is uh, implied by phi. Okay. Um, okay. Now you do not, what you do then is you use uh, the um, you, you you use the outcome from one evaluation of this this operator here, which is what you got here, this red curve. You put that right back in, and do another iteration, then re-estimate the parameters, and then you continue. And then actually, like after three iterations, you're very, very close to the fixed point, okay? It moves a little bit, and then, you know, here's after seven iterations, the implied choice probable is not really moving a lot from the third to the seventh. And, and so these are actually, after three iterations, you're pretty, you know, pretty close to the true estimates in this case. And this is uh, the implied uh, replacement probability for the MLE, where you get the exact same thing as if you were es essentially solving and estimating the model using the nested fixed point algorithm by John Rust. The Hudson Miller estimator is actually uh, originally formulated in, 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 in terms of uh, minimizing this system of, of, of equations. Um, so it's more like a like a GMM estimator, but but here it's easy to show that the first stage PI estimator or policy iteration estimator, uh, in the way the Kitakabirian Mira is formulating it, is really just the CCP estimator, where the instruments here are the derivatives of that um, of that policy iteration mapping uh, with respect to the stru structural parameters, where they're where they're uh, used as, as instruments. Okay, so you know just think about um, that that partial derivative is going to be equal to the derivative of um, uh, um, of of the uh, you know the derivatives of the LU functions. So um, so that's um, that's something you can compute. Okay. Okay, so yeah, again, we have the small, pr I think we kind of talked about the small issues with the small sample problems. And this problem kind of grows as you have more state variables. Uh, so the, 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 this is the really the benefit of a giddy gabriel Mira's approach is that you impose more and more structure from the model. And I think if you go back and look at this, the sequence of these graphs, if this was a bad guess to begin with, you're far away from the solution. 
Well, then you're gonna, uh, then you you will get have to do more uh, a longer sequence. Okay, and and the implied estimates would not be the equal to the true estimates, and you would need more data for for this. If you have many state variables, you would need more data to really get a precise estimate of the conditional choice probabilities. So Aguirre, Gabiri, and Mira, they make this Monte Carlo experiment. I'm gonna stop with this. Um, so um, what they do is they generate data from the Bosch engine replacement model uh, with parameters theta naught, which is like the replacement cost, and then their coefficient here on on um, um, uh, the coefficient on on the sl uh, slope of the utility function, where the coefficient on mileage. Okay, and they have uh, two hundred cells. So this is kind of corresponding to. You know, roughly the same uh, parameters as there is in in the uh, estimated example in the in engine replacement model. I think I rec I think there are two there are two. This parameter is two, but then there is like ninety cells. So this corresponds, um, um, yeah, maybe to a, a little bit smaller parameter. Anyway, so it's it's the same uh, it's the same model with linear utility. Okay. Okay, so what we're looking at first here is really just the distribution of the Monte Carlo estimates you would obtain by, by the nested fixed point algorithm. Okay, and, and just to get an, an idea of the precision of the estimates. So here you got the mean absolute error of, of, of the, um, uh, on the estimator, um, you know, diff mean absolute deviation from the true value. So when that's around two, which is corresponding to around uh, twenty percent of the uh, uh, estimated um, of the true value. Okay, so like twenty percent. Uh, um, that's kind of the precision of that estimate. So on average, okay, you know, twenty percent wrong on either side on average. Okay, and and then the median uh, is 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 is, uh, is is a little bit smaller. Okay. Standard deviation two point two. So not totally crazy. I mean, there's not a lot of replacement, not a lot of data. There's a thousand observations. So, so this is a this is a, this is a place where there's if you did not use maximum likelihood, well, then you would probably not be able to. I mean, then the, these estimates would be even less precise. This is what's going on down here. So you think of this as the CCP estimator, uh, because it's a policy iteration estimator only after one iteration, and and then you got the, uh, the another iteration, and then like three iterations. Just corresponding to these three different graphs here, one, two, and three, right? And then what I'm showing uh, here is the Monte Carlo results after one to three iterations. And what you see is really uh, now we are comparing uh, how close it is to the maximum likelihood estimator. So it's really uh, the the the, est the estimated uh, parameter with Gilligan and Mira divided by the by the MLE. So, so this is the percentage deviation from that. And, and so you get something like 4.7% of difference. Um, you got, uh, and that reduces uh, on average to to 1.6 if you two and make another iteration. And then already after um, three iterations, it's pretty close to the maximum likelihood estimator, um, which is also indicated in this graph. Okay. So you can do that with the other parameters as well, and you get kind of the same results. So the idea here is really you iterate and iterate and iterate, and then you get closer and closer to maximum likelihood, and you get more and more precise estimates. Uh, and actually, you can start this algorithm for any guess. You don't even have to solve for the. Um, uh, you don't ha even have to 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 do the pre-estimate of the CCPs. So this means that whatever you put in to. Um, to the sequence of estimators to begin with. You can put in like a complete uniform distribution, and it will converge if it's a um, uh, if 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 the Bellman equation to begin with is a contraction mapping. That's what they show, and it works beautifully for single agent problems. Okay, so I think that's that's pretty much it. Well, then they also calculate the ratio of the estimated standard errors um, in the Monte Carlo exercise. The estimated and the Monte Carlo standard deviation. These should be equal to one if the estimated standard errors are valid. Okay, 
and already after like uh, two uh, iterations, they they do a pretty good job. Okay, so so that's very nice. So they also show it's actually faster. Okay, so for most problems, the fixed point iterations, policy iterations are much more expensive than likelihood and pseudo likelihood hill climbing iterations. So that's why putting them outside of the loop and 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 doing a optimization. Uh, over the parameter size inside the loop, like let me show you here what I mean. The the loop on on that operator is really on the outside, right? In here where it says max, I'm maximizing over the parameter space. And what am I maximizing? I'm essentially maximizing li log of the likelihood that is coming from a static logit model. I mean, static logit models have globally concave likelihood functions, and it's going to converge really fast okay and and since you can also initialize this with the previous set of parameters that are already consistent next time you do an iteration it's going to be even faster right now this is what they mean by swapping the nesting of the fixed point algorithm it is that this iteration the successive approximation of this npl mapping is going on on the outside not the inside and since you have to do many of those uh fixed point iterations that those are slow it's better to have a few of them outside, like three, than having to do them for every time you search for the parameter space, every time you evaluate the likelihood. Okay, the size of the state space does not seem to affect the number of policy durations of any of those algorithms. Um, and, 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 and their implementations, impl they, they initialized with Hotz and Miller. And then they, if they do so, they found that NPL is around something like five to 10 times faster than NFXP. Um, yeah, so I think um, not much to say about this. We're on slide 29.